guess what, Alan? I'm on my YouTube channel right now, and I'm watching my YouTube channel, and it shows that we are live. Now, before we begin, folks, I had to reschedule this a little later than normal time. I know for some folks, I'm shadow banned, so they don't get the announcement that I'm live. And I didn't have time to share the link on you Skype with the individuals that I normally send links to an announcing we're about to go live, but that's okay. And before we begin, I just want to explain why I started a little later than normal for those of you listening. First, there's about 15 second delay. We're on StreamYard, meaning when I say something, when our brother Alan says something, and when it reaches you, it's about 15 second time difference. Secondly, let me repeat, the reason why I rescheduled is because I didn't know David Wood was going live with Robert Spencer an hour earlier, and then Christian Prince also went live. So I do not like to go live when other brothers are live or sisters are live because I don't want too many live streams because then we have people confused where to go. Even though it's archived and people can still benefit by watching later, Nonetheless, I still like it when I'm live and we can get as many people to listen because I want a lot of people in the live stream to interact with so I can get feedback, so I can make sure you're understanding the issues. And I hope that the Lord Jesus, the eternal Son of God, will destroy my ulterior motives, sanctify my motives, purify my motives. And I pray that for everyone, especially Alan, that we don't do it for the praise of men. May the Lord Jesus save us from prostituting ourselves spiritually for fame or fortune, but that our motive will always be sanctified by the Spirit to do it for the glory of Jesus, to bless the church of Jesus Christ so that we can serve as many members of the body of Christ by the Spirit for the glory of Jesus. And remember this, I'm not the teacher. Alan's not the teacher. The Holy Spirit of the living God is the almighty, perfect, glorious, beautiful, sovereign teacher sent by the Father and the Son, and the Father and the Son sent the Spirit to use human instruments, sanctified by the Spirit, to teach the body of Jesus Christ. So that's my hope. My hope is the Holy Spirit will take over this session, take over the ministries, Alan's ministry, mine, all of yours, take over our lives, the lives of our loved ones, and in my case, my daughters, and purify us in the holy blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, and fill us for the glory of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, we yield to you. We ask you. Bless this session for the glory of your eternal love, the Father's heart, Jesus Christ. Bless Alan, your servant, <clears throat> the servant of Jesus Christ, a child of God. Anoint him to recall the facts clearly, to present the material accurately and save him from error and stammering and distractions of Satan and illuminate hearts and minds to know what the Bible and the early church taught about the structure of the church that you set up for the glory of Jesus. We yield to you, Holy Spirit. We love you. Give us the power to love you perfectly, to love Jesus perfectly, to love the Father perfectly. Only you can empower us to do that. And give us the power to resist Satan and cleanse us in the holy blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus. And give us the health we need spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, physically to serve Jesus Christ. And I pray that for our loved ones, my daughters. Please have your way in Jesus' name. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, both now and forever, unto ages of ages. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. With that said, Alan, uh, I'm going to introduce you. Just guys, do pray for me. Once a week, I have a cheat day. Sadly, today's my cheat day. And because my body's accustomed to trying to eat healthy, pray for me that God will give me the super strict discipline to stay healthy. But on that cheat day, when I do cheat, I get sick. So I'm a little under the weather. And you can see I've changed my location in the house because my brother was using the kitchen. But Alan, before we begin your presentation, number one, who are you? What's your name? Tell us a little about yourself. My name is Alan Rule. Uh, I'm uh, a Catholic. I 
I got the website alanrule.com. I don't publish there too much anymore. I'm trying to focus on YouTube, and you can find me on YouTube under Alan Rule, A L L A N space R U H L. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm the only Alan Rule on YouTube. Go yeah. find, subscribe. A lot of good content coming up. I have a guy on Friday talking about traditional Catholicism in Latin America. He's from Chile. Um, so yeah, that's basically w what I do. I'm a cradle Catholic. I love uh, m my specialties in, in, in church history. And I like the fact that uh, like, like all of us apologists are, uh, um, are all good at s certain things. Like Sam is super good with scripture. Our friend William Albrecht, super good with the church fathers. I'm more of a church history guy. And Amen. so, uh, yeah. So like, yeah, we've all got our strengths and um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I can help out what I can. And, um, and uh, thanks for having me on Sam. Brother. In fact, it's an honor for me to have you on. In fact, you've had me on your channel Folks, I just posted the link in the comment section. You can see it on the screen, and it'll be in the description box. And Lord willing, I'll pin it as a comment. Please support this brother. I can say this. That's why I invited him. I reached out to him. He's one of my mods, but he has studied church history. And this is a very important aspect of our heritage we need to know. And you're going to see why this topic is important. He is filled with knowledge, and I pray the Holy Spirit will sanctify him. And use them more for the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, before we get into the topic of monarchical episcopate and why every <clears throat> born again, spirit filled member of the body of Jesus Christ needs to be interested in this topic, and unfortunately, many aren't, but that's okay. That's the work of the spirit to convict them to be passionate about the things that are necessary. Tell us a little bit about your interaction with James White because I titled it. James White's Ecclesio Ecclesiology Refuted, and I'll explain that in a minute. But you've had some encounters with James White in the past, right? If so, how, why, and when? Well, he has re refuted, uh, well, re responded, I won't say refuted, to a few of my blog posts on alanreal.com. Uh, and uh, th this is, like, I've called him out for inconsistencies. The same inconsistencies... He'll point out in Shabir Ali, Adnan Rashid, Paul w w Williams, quoting these modernist heretics as, oh, these are your scholars, you know, you've got to do it. Yet uh, I, I've called him out for doing the exact same thing to Catholics. He quotes Raymond Brown. He quotes R R Richard McBrien. He quotes the new Jerome Bible commentary. The exact same thing that Shabir Ali always quotes. But it's bad when he quotes it, but when James White quotes it, whoa, it's all good, you know? Amen. And so I've been uh, pointing that out to James White. And I've got other examples of what, uh, as well of how he used double standards. In fact, if you go to James White's um, YouTube channel, Alpha and Omega, and it, search my name, he spelt my name wrong. He only spelled it with w one L. You can find a whole, whole, whole hour-long episode, which he refutes me and it's total bs my protestant cousin l listened to that and he texted me after that that james white obviously doesn't know what he's talking about <laughs> you know and he doesn't you, you know he's um he's okay at a few things but this isn't one of them so uh and no, i pointed up. out that he learns all of his all almost all of his church history from modern protestants i was listening to his debate against Pacwa on the papacy, and he's quoting ninety. He, he he's quoting J and D cut J and D Kelly. He's quoting Trevor Jolon. Now I like Tre Trevor Jolon, but I mean, he's a modern Protestant. You know, quote the evidence. Quote the evidence. Don't be like Shabir Ali and Paul Williams and 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 people like that. Go to the source. Amen. So that's why for a minute I got scared because when you said he spells your name with one L, I thought you meant the rule because I spell your name, Alan, with two L's. But thank God I got that right. So let me just recap what you just said. James White will decry the use of liberal critical scholarship against the inerrancy of Scripture or his Protestant beliefs. But then he turns around and uses liberal critical scholarship 
that believes the Bible is full of errors, not historically accurate, or even inspired, even liberal critical Catholic scholars to refute Catholicism. And yet James White is the one who says inconsistency is a sign of a failed argument. So if you use one method against a particular view that you don't use against your own method, because if you did, it would refute your own position. James White says that's a sign of you being blatantly inconsistent. So are you saying that James White is inconsistent in the way he argues against Catholicism, brother? He's inconsistent, and inconsistency is the sign of a failed argument. You got it, brother. In fact, in a minute, I'm going to let him make his presentation, brethren. Please do me a favor. I want you to share this link. This is important historical information. When I say it's important, I wouldn't have this brother come on and address this issue. It isn't. This is something you need to know. If you're a serious student of the Bible and church history, and you love Jesus Christ, and you believe Jesus is faithful to his word, and he's building his church, he's going to show you what the church looked like in the early centuries, the apostolic churches, the churches established by the apostles, how the structure of authority was set up. Now, before I do that, Alan, not everyone is called to debate. Not everyone's called to write. Not everyone's called to preach. Not everyone's called to be a bishop. As you said, we all have our own unique giftings. Now, I do remember James White calling out to debate. Now, brother, you know your gifts. You know your weaknesses. I know my gifts. I know my weaknesses. Have you ever claimed to be a debater? No, but I'll... I'll tell you exactly what happened in that debate that time he responded to me and called me out i i called up alpha and omega ministries after that and i said uh rich pierce uh picked up the phone and uh i i asked to talk to james white and then he's like why it's like because he challenged me to a debate <laughs> and i'm like oh it's like oh you're alan okay uh, and then i i talked to white and uh, I'm like, okay, you challenged me to a de debate. Um, when did you want to uh, to do that? It's like, well, I'm booked for the next year. And I'm like, well, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, uh, is Montana okay? He's like, there's nothing in Montana. And I'm like, again, because keep in mind, I'm in Calgary in Canada. Straight south of me is Montana. And I can't, um, I can't, uh, uh, and 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 now it's hard to go anywhere else. Like I can't, and, COVID. And, yeah, because of the 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 China virus. But um, but uh, no, but like I I kind of opened this out to him. And this topic that we're talking about today, uh, if someone, if the guys at R Reason and Theology volunteer to moderate, I would love to debate uh, James White on the. Monarchial Episcopate in Rome, uh, being there from the start. So if he wants to uh, to debate this issue, I'm up for it, and I'm going to be quoting uh, primary sources, not 19th century frauds. I'll host it myself. I don't think he'll take me up on it because he doesn't like me too much now after the <clears throat> breakup and the fact that I'm calling him out. Now, just so people understand. Alan is not a professional debater, but you heard what he said. He reached out to James White, and he's willing to debate James White on this topic, even though he's not a professional debater. I'm not saying he can't debate, but he hasn't made it his ministry to go around and debate. James White has nearly 200 debates. He and William Lane Craig, among all the Christian apologists, I think he and Craig have the most moderated debates among all the apologists. But Alan still accepted James' debate challenge because James tried to bully him on the dividing line. Didn't work because he goes, I'll debate you on this topic, which leads me now to the next point. You just said monarchical episcopate, which I say monarchical, monarchical episcopate. We're using a very fancy term. What is the monarchical episcopate, number one? Number two, what is James White's argument regarding such an episcopate not existing in Rome. Why is it relevant? If you can give us real quick definitions, and if you have any questions for me, then I'll pull back and you can give a presentation showing James White is wrong. So, brother, 
what is monarchical episcopate in a nutshell? Because that's okay. a fancy term and it's above my pay grade. What does that mean? Okay, in terms of holy orders, there are three types of holy orders. The episcopate, which is the bishop, like um, like Sam, I don't know what city you're in, but I'm sure there's a Catholic bishop there. Uh, like I'm in Calgary, there's a bishop here. In some uh, countries where they don't have a lot of Catholics, it'll only be in the, the very large cities. In countries like Poland or, or Mexico, where they have a lot of Catholics, they'll they'll be in every city over 50,000 people. Uh, it's it's basically a single man at the head of a diocese, like of a city. You'll have the bishop of, say, Calgary. That's my city. There's a bishop of Calgary. And then under him, you have priests, sometimes called presbyters, who govern all the churches. And below them, you have the deacons who assist the presbyters. It's three-tiered. Now, what, what, what James White uh, tries to say is that early on, at... Um, in, in the first first century and possibly even the second, there was only two-tiered Presbyterian. The presbyter and the bishop were the same thing, and you had the deacon hello. And eventually, over time, you had a separation of this into something called presbyter and bishop. It used to be interchangeable, but now they split, so it went from two-tier to three-tier, and James White likes to say that uh, th that happened in Rome as well, that Rome was w one of the last places to go to two to three tier. And therefore, mm -hmm. you have no succession of bishops Baptist, back to St. Peter, and therefore the papacy is false. Now, it's true th that even if you do have succession all the way back to St. Peter, uh, that doesn't um, prove the papacy true. Uh, that's what uh, uh, th that's just a prerequisite for the papacy, but uh, no, no. but if it's not there, the papacy's false. And James White tries to use this lazy argument to try to refute the papacy, uh, or the fact that there was a monarchical bishop in Rome from Saint Peter. Yep. Yeah. Let me again sum it up. You're saying instead of using like say modern example like Calgary in the ancient church. The structure of the church is you have, let's say, a city, Antioch, Syria. And I want yeah. guys, you got to listen to this because we're preparing you for the presentation. The evidence, he's going to quote the sources to show whether white is right or wrong. So let's say Antioch, Syria, that place has a bishop. He's the head of all the churches in Syria. Underneath that bishop are what we call presbyters or elders who are subject to that bishop. And underneath them, there are deacons. So it's three-tiered, meaning bishop as the head of this place, head of all these churches. Underneath them are presbyters who are overseeing all those different churches in this area that the bishop is the head of. And then there are deacons that serve them. This is what you believe was the model of church governance started by the apostles. And James White believes, no, it was actually two-tier, a bishop Elders, same office. So there's a group of elders and deacons, because that's what he believes. He believes the structure of the church should be elders and, and deacons. Okay, so that's what he believes, and he believes that's what the church was. But then later, it evolved and mutated into bishop as the head of this place, let's say Antioch, Syria. Presbyters subject to the bishop and the deacons subject to them. He says that's not the original structure. That became the structure later. And he says that at Rome, this structure of the bishop being the head of Rome and all the churches at Rome, that didn't exist up until at least 150 AD. That's what White is claiming. Yeah. But you, go ahead, brother. I'm sorry. What do you want to say something? Well, well I, I, I'm like, yes, he's claiming that. Yes. Yeah. But you're going to show the evidence, the earliest evidence, as far back as we can trace it from the Disciples of the apostles, like Ignatius, and other sources, ancient apostolic sources from the people who were disciples of the apostles, show James White is wrong, and that from the very beginning, the structure of the church is bishop as the head of all churches in this area. Let's say so you have the bishop of Constantinople, or let's say Turkey, and then the presbyters subject him and deacons... That is the structure set up by the apostles, and the evidence shows that, and James White is wrong. That's what you're going to show tonight? Yes. Praise the Lord. Now, very important, 
because if this is the case, James White is wrong biblically and historically, even though he tries to claim to be an expert of church history. Now, one final thing, lest people think this belief is unique to Catholics. Do Orthodox also believe in a three-tier that historically bishop is the head, presbyter subject, and deacons, that was the form of the church from the beginning? Or are you Catholics the only guys that believe this? Uh, no, it's it's all the apostolic churches. Uh, include like the, the Catholic Church, obviously, the, the, the Orthodox Church, both Eastern and Oriental, y y your church as well, the Church of the east they also have the three tier like i'm sure the priest at your church yep. reports to a bishop somewhere yep. um and yeah no no it's what everyone has believed until some people in the 19th century thought they knew better and keep in mind the people that came up with this theory they also believe that the jepd theory of the torah that they think that isaiah had two or three authors they think that daniel was only 150 years before jesus christ they, they think the Bible's full of errors. It's this kind of uh, school of thought that this comes out. James White wants to take the one thing that helps him out, but it comes from a worldview that goes right against his. It's exactly like Shabir Ali and Paul Williams. So, brother, you're shocking me. You're telling me all the ancient apostolic churches, that churches go back to the apostles, believe in the structure, and it's only... <clears throat> At the 20th century, due to the rise of liberal scholarship that denies inerrancy of the Bible, inspiration of the Bible, and attributes errors to the Bible that came up with a different structure, and James White is following them? Is that what you just said? Yeah, 19th, 20th century. I don't know who exactly came up with it. I think it's a guy named Lamp, uh, pronounced, uh, spelt L-A-M-P-E. I think he was the first. I could be wrong, though. But it comes... The, the comes from the, the ultra skepticism of the 19th and 20th century. Oh. In fact, if you, you, you guys read uh, the top scholars of the scholars of the 19th and 20th centuries, like for example, I read a lot of Anglican books on the papacy. Y you can tell that these guys are working with a biblical worldview that is tainted with li liberalism, like Tr Trevor Jolin's book on the papacy. It, it, it's eight chapters. First two chapters are on on scripture. And you can tell, he, the book's from 1942. You can tell that he's in a milieu where it's very, like the view of scripture is very, very low. Hmm. Wow. And this is who James White's appealing to inconsistently. So brother, unless you have questions of me, let me just pe tell people the format. Invite more folks. Pro guys, I'm not exactly. This is probably one of the most important topics. All of you serious students of the Bible who love the Lord Jesus, love his church, need to learn. We're not here to entertain you, but we're not here to bore you. We're here to educate you with solid facts to know your faith. So if there was any session that needed hundreds of people to watch a life, it's this. You're going to learn about your <clears throat> history, how the apostles set up the church of Jesus Christ until the rise of modern Bible-rejecting scholarship. And yet James White claims to believe in Scripture. Now, with that said, brother, before you ask me questions, the structure for every one of you is he's going to give a presentation. He's going to quote the facts of history. He's going to quote authentic primary sources to show you what the structure of the church has been, that there was a bishop in Rome leading the churches there, a bishop in all these major seas of Christianity, and then we'll open up the Q&A. So I'll be in the background as he makes this case. If there's a session that you really needed to learn, it's this one. All sessions are important, but this is one of the most important. I'm not exaggerating. That's why I wanted the brother to teach. Now, did you have questions for me? Or are you ready to begin, brother? Yes. I'm going to start asking you a question. Who's the first historian of the church? Eusebius? Yes, Eusebius. Now, Sam, why did he write his history? That's an excellent question. I know he finished it by the year 324 AD, and I was reading snippets of it. But refresh my memory, brother. You're the scholar here. Well, he says the reason why in the very first sentence of the book. The very first sentence, if you don't believe me, go to New Advent, go to book one, yep. chapter one, the first sentence. And I'm going to show you 
the reason why he wrote it. He gives a few r reasons. I'm going to show you the very first r reason he gave. Uh, and he, he starts here, quote, it is my purpose to write an account of the lines of succession of the holy apostles, as well as of the times that have elapsed from the days of our Savior to our own. That's the very first sentence of his book. So the most important thing for him is to establish the lines of succession from the time of Christ and the apostles. Because to learn about Christ and the apostles, that's what a scripture is for. He's going to take it since then. That is how important apostolic succession was to the early church. I uh, uh -huh, you okay? The police are after you, brother. That's it, man. You're in trouble. Can you talk for a... Uh, yes, I will. Guys, yeah, sorry about that. Here, I'm going to show you the quote. Here's the quote from Eusebius. I just gave you the links. Okay, guys, I just gave you the links. So, guys, I put it in the comment section. I showed it on online. Here it is. Okay, sorry. I, I posted the wrong one. One second. Okay, it is my purpose, Eusebius, Ecclesiastical History, Book 1, Paragraph 1, Chapter 1. It is my purpose to write an account of the lines of succession of the holy apostles, as well as of the times that have elapsed from the days of our Savior to our own, and to relate the many important, important, let me get you the rest of it. Sorry about that. I'm going to give you the second part. Sorry, here it goes. Here's the second part. It's going to come up on screen. Hold on. There you go. Let me get it for you. Important events that are set to have occurred in the history of the church. And to mention those who have governed and presided over the church in the most prominent parishes and those who in each generation, here's the other part, in each generation have proclaimed the divine word either orally or in writing. So we got to break it down because there's only so much text you can put, but I just tried to break it down in three paragraphs. Here's the final one so you can see it on screen. So I just gave you the link for the online source. I gave you the link for the online source of the English translation of Eusebius Ecclesiastical History, uh, New Advent. I gave you the link. Book one. This is now chapter one, paragraph one. You just read it with your own eyes, so he's not lying. So what did Eusebius say his purpose was? He's going to give you the line of succession from the time of the early apostles of Jesus. Their time, their successors, the ones that they appointed to rule the churches, their successors, their successors, their successors up until the year 324 AD. Okay, so that was the first question he asked me, brother. Do you have another question for me? Uh, no, that's all, and I apologize for the fire alarm. Don't someone don't someone you understand, brother? pizza. Brother, don't you understand? You'll be under spiritual attack because you're doing some good. May the Holy Spirit anoint you and loosen your tongue to speak clearly. Guys, one of the most important subjects in the name of the Father and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Listen, I'll be in the background, and then we'll open up to Q&A. Okay, so um, I, I, I pointed that out with Eusebius just to show how important the early church thought apostolic succession was. In fact, I saw some very sketchy. It was really Tony Costa. That's that guy's name. He he just said, yeah, just something that they invented up. No, they absolutely treasured this and they've always believed in it. It's a very important doctrine, being able to trace it from the, the beginning. And they've always viewed this. It's not a joke. It's a very important, uh, very important doctrine, apostolic succession. Now, of course, so they um, say that, and, and, and that's a prime reason for Eusebius's work, the first history of the church. I'm going to prove these churches are legitimate from being apostolic. Now, they say that Rome had a late monoepiscopate, the mid-second century, uh, and they extrapolate from that. Well, I guess every bishop was like that. It happened in the East just a bit earlier. And of course, Catholics, Eastern and Oriental Orthodox, Assyrian Church, they all agree that there's... Now, the main evidence is against this is liberal scholars, which we've shown are a fraud. 
And um, of course, if James White wants to quote them, he has no business telling Shabir Ali or Paul Williams that they're being inconsistent when they quote uh, E.P. Sanders or, 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 or those clowns. Now, let me take some water here. In the first millennium of the church, actually in the second millennium as well, but in the first millennium of the church, there are people that oppose the Pope's authority. I'll cite a few examples. Uh, in about the year 250, St. Cyprian and Fermilian and about 80 other bishops oppose Pope Stephen's authority. Second example, in the 340s, the Arians opposed the authority of Pope Julius to reinstate bishops, specifically five bishops, in the East. And if you want to read more about that, go to Socrates' History, Book 2, Chapter 15, or um, or go to Sozomen's Ecclesiastical History, Book 3, Chapter 8. Another example of opposition papal authority is Photius of Constantinople, what's known as the Photian Schism in the 9th century. Photius opposed the Pope's authority. So that's three examples that a lot of people should know about. They all oppose the Pope's authority. Not one of these people, not one of these of these people that oppose the Pope used this argument. And, and, and these people had all read Ignatius and Clement. None of them used this. Why? Because they knew that Rome was an apostolic see. They just didn't think it had the power of the jurisdiction. And, and they had all read these books. They were like, oh, they'd all re re read Ignatius, and none of them went, oh, Ignatius doesn't address a bishop of Rome in the year 110. Maybe there was no, no, they all knew that there were bishops then. Um, and yeah, now I first want to establish that St. Peter was in Rome. And, and to do that, I will go to the Holy Scriptures. Now, uh, an argument from Scripture against this, that is used against this, is St. Paul's Epistle to the Romans, chapter 16. He, he, uh, says hi to a whole bunch of people in the church, a, a lot of people, but St. Peter's not there. But the later traditions say that St. Peter was in Rome. So is there a contradiction? We could force a contradiction, or we could harmonize the evidence, like the church has always done. Maybe he was not there for some reason. But uh, I'm going to show you some proof that he was in Rome from the scriptures. Um, let's go to first Peter. Now in the early church, there's two epistles of St. Peter in the early church, there was some doubt, uh, on the authenticity of, of two Peter, but first Peter, no question. And I'm going to show you, let's go to the scriptures. First Peter one, one first line of this to God's elect exile scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Pithynia. Now he's writing a, a letter to these places. Well, what does that presuppose? It presupposes that he's not there. Like, for example, if I were, were write a bishop, or if 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 I write a, a letter to say the Christians of New York City, that implies I'm not in New York City, right? So he's not in these places. Now that does not mean he's in Rome. He could be in the Holy Land or Antioch or whatnot. Uh, but it's some evidence that. He's not in those places. Now, uh, the second verse in uh, St. Peter's epistle, 1 Peter 2.17, quote, show, um, show proper respect to everyone, love the family of believers, fear God, honor the emperor, close quote. This, he brings up the emperor. When you're talking about the emperor, you think of Rome. Like, like think of... Now, this does not mean he's in Rome, because, of course, the whole the whole empire knew about the emperor. But um, uh, it, it's some secondary, softer evidence. But this last verse is open and shut case that St. Peter was in Rome. It comes toward the end of his epistle, 1 Peter 5.13. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, send you her greetings, and so does my son, Mark. 
Now, um, um, according to uh, Eusebius, let me quote Eusebius in the church history. You can go in newadvent.org, book two, chapter 15. Th this is what um, Eusebius says. And Peter makes mention of Mark in the first epistle, which they say he wrote in Rome itself, as is indicated by him when he calls the city by a figure, Babylon, as he does in the following words, the church that is at Babylon elected together with you, salute you, and so does Marcus, my son. Now, keep in mind, Peter, a Jew, he grew up reading the Old Testament. The Old Testament, you know about the Babylonians. They're the antagonists. It's like... It's like talking to an American in the Cold War. The most most howled name you can get is Moscow. That's the capital of the evil empire, as, as Reagan called it, right? So they knew what Babylon meant. Now, there is a natural Babylon, and that is in Iraq. Maybe he wasn't using a metaphor, but there's no evidence of that because there is zero tradition that St. Peter was in Iraq. Zero. Iraq at the time was part of the Persian Empire. The Persians were always going to war with the, the Romans. And there's no, no evidence that St. Peter went to the Persian Empire. Not one. He was in Babylon, a.k.a. Rome. Now, uh, okay. All right, so that's the scriptural evidence that he was in Rome. Let's uh, go to some... Let's go to some early church evidence. First, Clement. There's an epistle written by Clement to the Church of Corinth about 100 AD. In, cha um, in chapter 5 of St. Uh, of St. Clement's l l letter, he's trying to give examples of people to follow. This is chapter 5. But let us cease from ancient examples and come to those athletes nearest let us take the noble examples of our generation because of jealousy and envy the greatest and most righteous and most righteous pillars were persecuted and uh, attained to death L let us place before our view the good apostles let us take peter who because of unjust jealousy endured not one or two but many hardships once he gave his testimony he went to the place of glory owed to him because of jealousy and strife. Paul showed, for, and, and he goes to talk about St. Paul because St. Paul was also killed in Rome. And why is he doing that? These are the two most Im immediate examples he has. And and there's actually a good um, a footnote by th the editor, Kenneth J. Howell. But I'm not going to read it because I'm not going to argue from scholars. I'm going to argue from th the evidence. So that's like me saying my hometown is Edmonton. If I'm trying to give an example of a, a famous person there, I'll probably appeal to J Jordan Peterson because he has the same hometown as me, according to Wikipedia. In fact, we went to the same university. So that's what you need to do. So th that, that just shows, since he's using that example, it's obviously closest to, to his heart because he was in Rome. He probably knew Peter. Now, okay, where are we? So hence, I think that's enough proof to show Peter was in Rome. Now, let's establish that there was an early monarchical episcopate in Rome. Now, probably the best argument in favor of James White's position is St. Ignatius. Ignatius, he writes seven letters. He addresses a bishop in all these letters, but for Rome, he does not address a bishop. Now, according to James White, the reason is that there was no bishop in Rome. It was governed by a college of elders, but he doesn't address a college of elders either. How come no one brings up that? If that's equally against the monarchical bishop, it should be equally against a college of elders, right? But um, I've stopped expecting consistency from Dr. White. Now, uh, let me... So... Now, w when you read St. Ignatius's epistles, you can find them on that same w website, New Advent. He has seven. And I'm going to... Uh, there are certain themes you get when you read his six epistles. L let's put Rome to the side for a second. There's certain, well, th there's a ton of themes in his r writing. One is the authority of the monarchical 
Bishop. Now I'm going to uh, share some quotes um, when um, of of uh, of Saint Ignatius in those six epistles. <clears throat> Quote. Wherefore, it is fitting that you should run together in accordance with the will of your bishop, which thing also you do. For your justly renowned presbytery, worthy of God, is fitted as exactly to the bishop as the strings are the harp. Close quote. Epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 4. Here's another uh, quote. I exhort you to uh, to study to do all things with divine harmony. While your bishop presides in the place of God, while your bishop singular presides in the place of God, and your presbyters in the place of the assembly of the apostles, along with your deacons who are most dear to me and are entrusted with the ministry of Jesus Christ. Close quote. Epistle to the Magnesians, chapter six. Again, all these quotes are available on New Advent dot com or is it org i can't remember new advent anyways um another quote quote be subject to the bishop and to one another as jesus christ to the father according to the flesh and the apostles to christ and to the father and to the spirit that so there may be a union both fleshly and spiritual close quote epistle to the magnesians chapter 13 here's another quote i'm i'm trying to hammer the point home. Quote, in like manner, let all reverence the deacons as an appointment of Jesus Christ and the bishop as Jesus Christ, who is the son of the father and the presbyters as the Sanhedrin of God and assembly of the apostles, epistle to the Trallians, chapter three. Next quote, take heed then to have but one Eucharist for there is one flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ and one cup to the unity of his blood, one altar, as there is one bishop along with the presbytery and deacons. That's actually a good uh, passage if you want to talk about his theology of the Eucharist, but we're not going to do that here. We're talking about the Monarchy Episcopate. That's his epistle to the Philadelphians, chapter 4. Now, uh, I have two more quotes. Oh, no, sorry, Smyrnians. Sm yeah, yeah, no, sorry, that was Philadelphians. I got two in his epistle to the Smyrnians coming up. These two are very important. It's not lawful without the bishop either to baptize or to celebrate a love feast, but whatsoever he shall approve of that is also pleasing to God so that everything that is done may be secure and valid. Epistle to the Smyrnians, chapter 8. The last quote on this. He who honors the bishop has been honored by God. He who does anything without the knowledge of the bishop does serve the devil. Whoa. Uh, Epistle to the Smyrnians, chapter 9. So, you get the idea. Obey the bishop. Don't do anything without the bishop. He's in the place of God. He's telling people to follow this. And there's more quotes I could give. Go read these six epistles, the six, excluding Rome for the second. Go read these uh, six epistles, and you will see the constant evidence. Obey the bishop. He's in the place of God. Do what he does. No exceptions. Don't baptize without him. Don't celebrate feasts without him. In other words, he's part of the church. No ifs, ands, or buts. Now, if the church, because according to James White, James uh, Ignatius, Ignatius, according to White, knows that there is no monarchical bishop in Rome. That's why he doesn't address the monarchical bishop. Now, keep in mind, he's been, if Rome, if the Church of Rome does not have a monarchical bishop, they're in big disobedience. They're in huge disobedience. Don't do anything without the bishop. He's in the place of God. If you're not serving the bishop, you're serving the devil. Don't even baptize without him or celebrate a feast day. <clears throat> so you get the idea. So if Rome does not have that, he's going to give Rome heck. He's going to say, get your act together, Rome. Start getting a, a bishop. So he's going to give Rome heck. Does he give Rome heck? No. He says this. 
in his his intro to the 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 church of Rome from his epistle quote the church which is beloved and enlightened by the will of him that wills all things which are according to the love of Jesus Christ our God which also presides in the place of the region of the Romans worthy of God worthy of honor worthy of the highest happiness worthy of praise worthy of obtaining her every desire worthy of being deemed holy and which presides over love in the name uh, is named from Christ and from the Father. So it's worthy of all of these greatest things, but <laughs> but but that makes no sense if they don't have a bishop of Rome. And Ignatius knows they don't have a, a monarchical bishop. It's like me, for example. I got a friend named H. D. Y you guys know nothing about my friend H. D. Apart from the fact that he's m my friend. And let's say that I say over and over again that I only r respect people who believe Christ is Lord, right? And I say that over and over. Then I write a letter to HD. And HD, I tell him that I have a lot of respect for him, but that's all I say. Then I go and talk about something. Wait, I only respect people that believe Christ is Lord. That implies that HD believes that Christ is Lord. Right? So, um, I think you, you get the point. He, he's not going to praise him to the skies and say he's worthy of all this stuff unless they had him an archaeo bishop, because that's very important to the theology of St. Ignatius as demonstrated by those six other epistles, by those quotes I gave, and there's plenty more. Go read the epistles on New Advent. They're not that hard to read. They're very short. All right. That's the first argument uh, of St. Ignatius, that he knows there's a monarchical bishop in Rome. The next argument is that if you read his epistle to the Romans, you'll notice it's a very different character than all his other epistles. For example, in his epistles, he's not only identifying the bishop, He's identified presbyters in some cases, in deacons, and laity of the quote in, in, in the church. Uh, like, for example, in the epistle to the Magnesians. Since then, I have had the privilege of seeing you through Damas, your most worthy bishop, and through your worthy presbyters, Bassus and Apollonius, and throughout my fellow servant, the Deacon Sotio, whose friendship may I I ever enjoy, inasmuch as he is subject to the bishop, as to the grace of God, and to the presbytery, presbytery as to the law of Jesus Christ. So there, he, not, not only is he mentioning the bishop, he's mentioning presbyters and deacons. In fact, <clears throat> I made a chart. I actually made a chart of all the churches and who he identifies in every church. And by re reading his six epistles, you can identify who individual people at what church. The, the only ones that is, um, uh, you probably can't do that, is Philadelphia. But he says two people that are with him, and he names them Philo and Reyes Agathopus are part of the church in Philadelphia. They're just with Ignatius at the, at the moment w when he's sending the epistle. So therefore, you know people from all... For, for example, the Church of Ephesus. Church of Ephesus. The bishop is Onesimus. There's no presbyters named. Obviously, there's presbyters there, but they're not named. He names one deacon, Barest or Perhus, and two members of the... Laity, Euplus, and Fronto. He's naming these people in the church while he's writing the letter. Now, in the epistle to the Romans, take a guess how many names he identifies as being at Rome. Like there's there's people in the Roman church, but how many names does he give? Does anyone know? Zero. Zero. He's obviously being very secretive about the church to Rome. Um, presumably because of persecution, 
although we don't know 100% sure, because the only way to know is to ask Ignatius, and he's been dead for 1,900 years. The only name that Ignatius mentions in the Epistle to the Romans is a guy named Crocus. And Crocus is not at Rome. Crocus is with Ignatius. Which gonna... Okay. So, um, yeah, so th th therefore his epistle to the Romans is of a way different character than his epistle to uh, those other six. It's kind of like if I'm writing a, a letter to a church in New York or England or Poland or or Russia. <clears throat> it's like, yeah, I'll say hi to this to me, but if I'm writing a church... Uh, an, an epistle to like a church in, in Saudi Arabia. Am I going to say, oh yeah, say hi to Pastor Ali and say hi to the deacon um, Ahmed or whatever. No, I'm not going to do that because that reveals, it puts them in danger. St. Ignatius seems to be doing that with rum as well. <clears throat> All right. Uh, what next? All right, now that's my main argument. So uh, that explains why Ignatius doesn't explicitly say there's a bishop of Rome. He obviously knows it's there, but he omits it for certain r reasons. And we know they do have one because he praises the church to the skies. And he wouldn't do that if they were contradicting his theology. A couple anticipated objections. Um... Uh, first Clement in chapter 42, he only mentions the bishop and the deacons. Where's the presbyter? Go to paragraph 44, just two paragraphs later. He talks about the bishop and the presbyters. So presbyter is not interchangeable with bishop in St. Clement. Only if you read paragraph 42. And, um, uh, but and ignore 44. A lot of people do this. A lot of people do this. In, in, in fact, I printed th this article off a Protestant apologist w w website. I'm not going to say the name. All right, I'll say uh, I'll to, to send my source. It's, it's, I believe it's Ken Temple's w w website. And he only cites... Um, Where are we? Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, oh, sorry. I'm thinking of something else. But uh, that's a St. Jerome quote. That's coming up. Um, so ignore that. But the point is, First Clement 42 and 44. There is one, um, a very minor objection in the pastor of Hermas, where he talks about the bishops, the teachers, the deacons. But teachers obviously interchangeable for presbyter. Again, you can get that on New Advent. Uh, that is Book One, Vision Three, Chapter Five. Teachers and presbyters are interchangeable. Now, a famous quote that is accepted uncritically, uncritically, is my last argument, and then we'll open it up to questions. But I'm gonna completely destroy this argument that is used by a lot of people. St. Jerome. St. Jerome um, says that bishop and presbyter used to be the same, then they separated. I'm going to read two quotes from St. Jerome in his commentary on, on, on St. Paul's epistle to Titus. And then I'm going to shred, shred this argument. Because the people who made this argument... Don't read Jerome. They read quote lines. Oh, yeah, look at this. There's a Protestant apologist recently who made a big deal out of this. Oh, look at Jerome. I sent him my article. It, it was Dr. Uh, Gavin Ortland in his debate with, I believe it was Swan Sona. Now, all right, here's the, the quote, the, the two quotes. The first quote. A presbyter, therefore, is the same as a bishop, and before dissensions were introduced into religion, 
by the instigation of the devil, and it was said among peoples, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am, and I have Cephas. Churches were governed by a common council of presbyters. Afterwards, when everyone thought that those whom he had baptized were his own and not Christ, it was decreed in the whole w- world that one chosen out of the presbyters should be placed over the rest, and to whom all care of the church should belong, that the seeds of schisms might be plucked up. Whosoever thinks that there is no proof from Scripture, but that that this is my opinion, that a presbyter and bishop are the same, and that one is a title of age, the other of office, let him read the words of the apostle to the Philippians, saying, Paul and Timothy, as servants of Christ to all the saints, in Christ Jesus, who are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Close quote. That's the second one. This is one from Temple's website. Here's the second quote from Jerome that uh, that Temple gives. Therefore, as we have shown, among the ancient presbyters were the same as bishops, but by degrees that the plants of dissension might be rooted up. All responsibility was transferred to the one person. Therefore, as the presbyters know that it is by the custom of the church that they are to be subject to him who is placed over them. So let the bishops know that they are above presbyters rather than, rather by custom than by divine appointment and ought to rule the church in common following the example of Moses, who when he alone had power to preside over the people, the people Israel to 70 with the assistance of whom he might judge the people. We see, therefore, what kind of presbyter or bishop should be ordained, close quote. Well, we're done, boys. Look at Jerome. We're done. Pack it in. Or... Okay, now. I'm sorry. I thought you said you're on. Go ahead. Oh, I, I was being sarcastic. I guess I wasn't doing a good job. I apologize. How do I respond to this? I respond by reading the other writings of Jerome. If this was all Jerome said, let me uh, quote from St. Jerome. You, you can get this on New Advent, by the way. And this is really going to bode bad for the people that misuse the Titus uh, commentary quote. In Jerome's writing, De Viris Illustribus, translated on illustrious men, you can find this on New Advent. He talks about 130-something holy men, saints, and he starts out with Simon Peter. Now, Simon Peter's not going to be the, the first bishop of Rome, if that was, if, if that was true, w- what he said. He's certainly not going to be the, the first bishop of Antioch before that, because that's even earlier. We're talking about 30s and 40s. Let's see what St. Jerome says about Simon Peter. So Simon Peter, the son of John from the village of Bethsaida in the province of Galilee, brother of Andrew the Apostle, and himself chief of the Apostles, after having been bishop, singular, of the church of Antioch and having preached to the dispersion, the, the, the believers in circumcision in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia pushed on to Rome in the second year of Claudius, just remember that, to overthrow Simon Magus and, and held the sacerdotal chair there for 25 years until the last, that is the 14th year of Nero. Now, it says he went to, from, from, Antioch, from Antioch to Rome, in the second year of Claudius. Now, Claudius becomes emperor in 41 AD. So the second year is 42. So he's in Rome at 42. He stays there 25 years. So he dies in 67. And that's the 14th year of Nero. And Nero became emperor in 54. So the 14th year would be 67. Therefore, he has no problem admitting that he was the not only was he the monarchical bishop of Rome, but the monarchical bishop of Antioch prior to that. And so there's two possibilities. One, he contradicted himself 
therefore we shouldn't be using him on this subject. Or two, the, the, the evolution that happened happened in the apostolic period, therefore it's allowable. Uh, now, I still think he's wrong, but the point is you have him, the same person, St. Peter, who was a monarchical bishop even before he got to Rome. Why doesn't James White or other people who use this quote this? Why don't they? Because they don't know it exists because they have read those, those two statements from the commentary of Titus. They have not read the commentary of Titus. They've read quote minds. And I actually read Jerome. And when you read Jerome, he either contradicts himself, in that case we shouldn't listen to him, or this happened in like the first year or two. And then he became Bishop of Antioch. And Rome has had a monarchical bishop from 42 AD when St. Peter went there. And of course, as we know, Peter and Paul were the pillars of Rome. Um, that is my last argument. I, I, I demolish a St. Jerome. Uh, we're at the one hour and one minute mark. I'm open to your questions. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, actually, I enjoyed it. And this is why I'm going to repeat again, guys. You do not know how important this discussion was. And you don't know how fortunate and blessed we are to live at an age where you just pray for internet and God in his sovereignty has guided even unbelievers to post materials, articles, writings, sources online for free. Newadvent.org. I just posted the links to the quotes <clears throat> from Eusebius in the description box. And I just posted the link to this quote from Jerome in the description box. And I added the quotations. Lord Jesus willing, I'm going to pin that as a comment. And also I'll try to take all what he said from Ignatius and these other citations and make a blog post to make it easier for you. Instead of you searching out the citations, we'll make it available for you, make it accessible for you, free of charge, so you can use this information. So please ask the Holy Spirit, speak the face of the Holy Spirit to understand what you saw, heard, and what you're going to read. Absorb these facts, present them clearly, and distribute, disseminate this information to correct the lies, the distortions of Protestants like James White, you said Gablin Ortland, and Ken Temple. Now, by the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, make this session go viral. Share the links to people watch this. Hit the like button. I've given you the link to his YouTube channel, alanruhul.com. Lord willing, he'll be back on. Help this brother go viral as well. And you can always contact him. And he'll give you his information. Now, I'm going to ask some questions for clarification, brother. Okay, Sam. Uh, j j just before you ask the first question, you talked about uh, the links with all the quotes. For those quotes, for all the Ignatius stuff and for the First Peter stuff, I printed articles off my uh, my website, alanroll.com. Okay. Yeah, so if you, you want, I'll send you the links after. And then we could, um, sure. so, so it, it, it places them all in, in one place. Oh, good. So here is the link to his blog, alanruhul.com. I'm now going to show it on the screen. So you've already done it. You've already gathered them one place? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Looks like I can send you the specific l links. Like I got uh, the first one I got is from... Um, uh, it, it, they're from 2020... Uh, September and August. Uh, it's all there on your yeah. blog post, then the link which I just posted. Because if you see, it, you can't see it. I don't think because you're not on my YouTube channel. But in the screen, I just put, and they can see on the screen. I put in the comments, alanruhel.com. Now, yeah, and the 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 three articles. I'll just say the name of the articles. The first one is Babylon is Rome in one Peter five. Uh, the second one is re refuting James White's fav argument against the papacy. And the third one is why didn't St. Ignatius mention the Bishop of Rome? So, And that's all on his blog. And you see the link right there on the screen. So I'm going to ask some questions for clarification. Okay. Lord willing. Okay, guys, I'm going to ask questions 
So you understand how devastating refutation this is and how ancient this structure, this three-tiered structure of bishop as the head of the churches in a specific location and presbyters ruling those churches under the authority of that bishop and deacons serving the presbyters and the bishop. This is known as a monarchical, monarchical technical term, monarchical episcopate or episcopate, like I pronounce it, because I butcher words. Okay, now, let me ask the question for clarification, and then we'll open up to Q&A. This video should go viral. We should have 30,000 people watching this in time, in Jesus' name, for the glory of Christ. You need to learn your history, guys. You need to learn your history. You need to learn about your spiritual ancestors. Ignatius wrote seven letters. Let me give a little background for the people who may not know how important Ignatius is. Ignatius was the bishop of the church in Antioch, Syria. Notice he's the bishop. As the bishop in Antioch, Syria, he is a disciple of the apostles. He knew the apostles. He met with them, knew John, and they would have appointed him. In these seven letters that have been preserved and translated in English, and which you can read on newadvent.org for free online, he wrote seven letters on his way to being martyred in Rome. He had been taken prisoner, and they were taking him to Rome to feed him to the lions. As he's writing to the church at Rome, he begs the Christians there, don't stop me from being martyred. I want to be flesh for the beasts to offer my flesh as bread to God. He's begging them, let me die as a martyr. This is how passionate he is for Jesus Christ. He loves Jesus Christ so much, he was begging to die as a martyr, and he died as a martyr for the glory of Christ. And now he's alive with our Lord Jesus. Now, why is he important? Not only is he a holy martyr, he's a bishop of the church in Antioch, Syria. If you don't know why that's important, Antioch, Syria was a hotbed for apostolic activity. In fact, in Acts 11.26, brethren, please pay attention. In Acts 11.26, it says it was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. God revealed to the believers at Antioch, to be named Christians. That's where the name Christian was first given by God as the identity of the followers of Christ. That's how important Antioch is. Peter frequented there, Paul and Barnabas, hotbed of missionary activity. And in these letters, Ignatius refers to the Catholicos, the Catholic Church. He calls the church Catholic. Now, why is this important? As an eyewitness of the apostles, he is writing two letters established by the apostles, such as the Ephesians. That's the church that Paul wrote to. And we have one, his inspired writer, inspired writing to the Ephesians. Holy Spirit, give us unction to speak clearly. His inspired letter to the Ephesians in the New Testament. And he's writing to some of the same churches that Paul wrote to and established. And in all these churches, the only one that he doesn't mention, the bishop, and this is what I'm setting up for. Guys, I'm not trying to preach because I want attention. I'm trying to set up for the question. In all these other churches, exception Rome, he mentions that each of these churches established by the apostles, <clears throat> churches that go back to the apostles, each church has a bishop ruling over it. And he says the bishop is the head of the presbyters, the elders, and they are over the deacons. And he says the bishop is in the place of Christ. So you better honor the bishop, because if you don't honor the bishop, you don't honor Christ. He who submits to the bishop submits to Christ. So he's assuming this is the structure of all the churches established by the apostles. And he's one of those bishops. If this structure of having a three-tiered authority, hierarchical structure, is not biblical, if it's not anchored in Scripture, and it doesn't come from the apostles, that means the very eyewitnesses to the apostles, the disciples of the apostles, had corrupted themselves and perverted the structure of the church, even in the lifetime of the apostles, which would be blasphemy. But that's not my question. My question for our brother is, since Ignatius is an eyewitness of the apostles, a holy martyr who is a bishop himself appointed by the apostles, and he recognizes each church must have a bishop appointed legitimately by an apostle. And that bishop represents Christ over that church. And they must submit to the bishop as they submit to Christ. When it comes to the letter to the Romans, 
Ignatius doesn't mention a bishop there. And according to what you just told us, the reason would be most likely because Rome being the capital of the empire, where there was the hotbed of emperor worship, where those who didn't worship the gods and goddesses of the pagans or the emperor could be killed, where those who didn't offer sacrifice to the gods could be killed, you're saying it's most likely Ignatius didn't mention the bishop there because he didn't want to give out his name so that he wouldn't add to his trials and possibly get him arrested and killed? That would be my best guess. We can't know for sure, right? Because the only way to know for sure is to ask Ignatius, who's been dead for 1,900 years. But uh, th that would make the most sense because not only is he secret about the, the name of the bishop, he's secret about the name of the, the presbyters and the deacons and the l laymen in the church as well. And I challenge everyone to do the same thing I did. It takes about half an hour to an hour. Just go and see who he names in every church. He names deacons, presbyters, l laity. Not in Rome. In Rome, not one name is identified with the church in Rome. The only name uh, in that epistle is Crocus, and Crocus is w with St. Ignatius. Okay, so as our brother just stated, that's the most likely reason why it wouldn't be mentioned. But now let's explain how this refutes James White. According to James White, this is James White's argument to show you how dishonest or ignorant he is. And he claims to teach church. Can you imagine James White teaching you church history? God forbid. May the Lord save the people from his misinformation. According to James White, this letter by Ignatius to the Christians at Rome proves there was no bishop at Rome at that time. Because James White follows liberal scholarship that says the bishop of Rome came later, around maybe 150 AD. But up until 150 AD, approximately, there was no one bishop of Rome. And Ignatius' letter to Rome proves it because he doesn't mention a bishop of Rome. But now notice why this shows James White's dishonesty and or ignorance. And he shouldn't be teaching church history because he's going to deceive people, whether knowingly or un unknowingly. As our brother just said, Ignatius doesn't even mention presbyters or deacons at Rome. So if we apply James White's argument, the fact that Ignatius did not mention not, not just the fact no bishop is mentioned. He doesn't even mention there were presbyters or deacons. That means if James White's going to be honest, he'd have to argue that even around 107 AD, because Ignatius wrote around 107 AD, there were no presbyters or deacons at Rome if James White's argument is to believe, correct? Yes, and, and keep in mind uh, St. Ignatius in his epistles He's not only identifying deacons and presbyters, but members of the laity as well. For example, the, the church in Smyrna, he, uh, the bishop's polycarp, obviously, he mentions four members of the laity, Tavius and, and LC, that's A-L-C-E, I don't know how to pronounce that, Daphnis and Eutechnus. So he's just throwing out the names, yeah, say hi to these chaps. But in Rome... None of that's mentioned. So none of that. So if James White is right, that means there were no presbyters or deacons at Rome. They had no church structure, which would be stupid and nonsense, right? That's an argument from silence. Yeah. Okay, so you guys understand the the point. James White is so inconsistent or dishonest that his argument ends up proving not only there wasn't a bishop of Rome when Ignatius wrote. They didn't even have elders or deacons, something that James White does not believe. You see why you can't trust this man? He's not honest with the sources. He butchers the sources because he's not interested in facts. He's interested in winning debates and to deceive you to follow his understanding. And I have to be honest, I'm not politically correct. So now we got that argument. Secondly, you also said that for Ignatius, the bishop stands in the place of Jesus Christ because he represents Christ on earth as the head of those churches. And he would not respect any people, any person, who would not submit to the bishop. That's what you said, right? Yes, and that's clear from so many quotes from Ignatius. Now, my question to you is, you're basically saying 
How in the world then would Ignatius respect the churches at Rome and praise them and greet them if they were not following this structure that Ignatius said is of God? And if you don't follow this structure, submitting to the bishop, then you're dishonoring God. How would he then respect the church at Rome if it didn't have the same structure? Is that what you're saying? That's exactly w what I'm saying, y you know, like don't do anything without the bishop. It says you're not even allowed to baptize or celebrate a feast day without the bishop. And l let me read again the small Wait. paragraph that St. Ignatius says as the preamble to his epistle to the Romans. Quote, the church which is beloved and enlightened by the will of him that wills all things which are according to the love of Jesus Christ our God, which also presides in the place of the region of the Romans, worthy of God, worthy of honor, worthy of the highest happiness, worthy of praise, worthy of obtaining her every desire, worthy of being deemed holy, and which presides over love, is name from Christ and from the Father. Hmm. Close and quote. He would never have said that to a church that dishonored Jesus by not following the structure that Ignatius said is of God. Bishop, as the head of that church, presbyters subject to the bishop and deacons underneath them. Yeah. Yeah, and he keeps saying it's crucial. Do nothing without the bishop. If you're not a bishop, you're not uh, you, 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 You're not a church. You're, but there's no way that he would l lavish these words of praise. Amen. I agree. And... Uh, and have a church that's, that's disobedient to this key concept that's so important to St. Ignatius. Amen, and 100%. So guys, learn these arguments because James White's arguments have been decimated and he's exposed. Honestly, I have to say, the man is a fraud. May God either grant him repentance or hand him over to what he deserves and God have mercy on us in Jesus' name. Now, as far as Clement is concerned, Clement of Rome, you mm -hmm. stated that Protestants will quote Chapter 42 of Clement to show that he mentions bishop and deacon as if bishop is the same as presbyter, but then they don't quote chapter 44 where he mentions bishop and presbyters. Yeah. Yeah. Because so people understand. I just want to explain. Hammer that point. In Clement of Rome, some Protestants will say, see, the bishop and the presbyters are the same. They're not two different offices because he mentions. In chapter 42, bishop and deacon, showing that the bishop is the presbyter, so it's the same group. But then they do not quote chapter 44, where their bishop and presbyters are mentioned as two separate groups. Elaborate on that so they can get the point why this is a dishonest argument again, by just quoting chapter 42 but not 44. Well, because, I mean, if you, you read chapter, like, like for example, like, like I like to study a lot of the, uh, the Crusades, and there may be a show on this in the future. Yes, there will be, uh, God willing. Th there's a, a primary source I read called Fulcher of Chartres. He, he was a, um, a priest on the First Crusade who chronicled everything. And if you just go and r read about the Siege of Jerusalem, they talk about killing 10,000 people on the Temple Mount, right? But... And it's like, oh, that's so horrific. How could they kill 10,000 people? And that's all people do. They just go and read those three or four pages. But if you read all his other pages, he inflates the numbers massively. If you go to the, 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 the Crusader army at the Siege of Nicaea was 600,000 people. Impossible. The Turkish army at the Battle of, of Ori Lam, 380,000 people impossible those are huge exaggerations so obviously the 10,000 is the exaggeration as well and if you and if you had only read the little part which most people do the quote you would get the impression that 10,000 people were killed when it was actually probably one or two thousand mm. and that's the same thing with Clement if you only read chapter 42 yeah you, you could come out with that information. But as soon as you read, because a uh, 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 bishop and the, the deacons, meaning presbyter and bishop, are interchangeable. But once you get to 44, it's the bishop and the presbyters. So they're not interchangeable, obviously. No. They're two separate categories. 
Exactly. And like you said, you got to read the whole thing. That's why I'm a huge advocate of not r- reading quotes. Like there's a, a very important book that I've been using for my r- resources. It y- You get so much more if you read from front to back. And that same goes for everything. Jerome and Clement. But see, that's why God raises up people to do the work that prove themselves to be honest men, honest women, men, women of integrity, that when they say something is there, we can take them at the word. It's there because not all of us can do that kind of research. See, you're gifted. Study church history. That's why you're a gift to the church. That's why people need to praise God for you and support you because I don't have the time that you invested into the church fathers because God has called me to study other areas. So that's how we complement each other. So praise God for you. So brethren, make this video go viral. Now, so you understand the same Clement in the letter, <clears throat> First Clement, it's called First Clement, Clement to the Corinthians. In chapter 42, if you read it, you get the impression that Clement is saying bishop and presbyters are the same. You go to 44 and you have the same structure. Bishop, different from presbyters, different from deacons. Same structure. A bishop is not the same as a presbyter and they're not the same as deacons. So he shows you he's following the same structure that Ignatius and other disciples of the apostles followed. So that refutes that argument. The final argument I need you to repeat, and everyone got it, but it's, again, we're creatures of repetition. That's why I keep hammering it. I want them to get it. You have a Protestant scholar who's now making a name for himself, and sadly, I've been seeing a lot of refutation because he's sloppy, he's poor, he is <clears throat> what they call quote mining, so he's following the pattern of James White, even though he claims to be a scholar, Gavlin Ortland. I don't know much about him. I actually met him face to face. But now I've been seeing that he's going around doing videos criticizing Catholicism. And now people like Michael Laughlin and William Albrecht are exposing his misinformation, miscitation. It seems that though he claims to be a scholar, he's actually parroting James White and others and their misinformation. Because you just said that according to to Gavin Ortland, Jerome stated that presbyters and bishops were the same. It's only in time where a bishop was distinguished from presbyters as a way of refuting the belief that from early on, all apostolic churches, churches had a bishop as the head of the church in a local area, presbyters subject to the bishop and deacons beneath them. So he's quoting Jerome to show at the beginning, presbyters were the same as bishops and only later it evolved. So that's Gavin Orton's assertion, right? Yeah, he's um, he's basically doing the same thing that, that White and other Protestants have done. They, they found that St. J- Jerome quote somewhere in... Uh, uh, I don't know. They found it in some scholarly book and they've not actually bothered to go and read Jerome's entire work. And uh, of course I haven't re- read St. Jerome's entire work, but I I'm trying to, you know, but uh, there's more to St. Jerome than just that quote, just like there's more to St. Clement than chapter 42. And right. w- if, if we want, we could say, Sam, uh, Shamoon, you, you're an expert in the scriptures. You know that the Bible says um, th- there is no God. Oh, but wait, when you look deeper, it says the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Yep. So you need to read everything, not just, ooh, I found a sn- snippet. And I agree. In fact, now I'm going to read the quote you gave, and I'm going to ask the question that the brother asked. Here's the quote. This is from Jerome. There's the link, guys. I posted it in the description box. I posted in the comments. Now, here's what Jerome says. Let me repeat the quote he read. This comes from an illustrious men. I gave you the link. It's translated in English. And here from that section on Simon Peter, he goes through mentioning people like Simon Peter, James Adjust. Now, notice this is what he read, but we're going to repeat it again. One, Simon Peter. Simon Peter the son of John from the village of Bethsaida in the province of Galilee, brother of Andrew, the apostle, and himself chief of the apostles, after having been bishop of the church of Antioch and having preached to the dispersion, 
So you have a bishop as the head of that church there. And he says, who's the bishop? Let me read. Simon Peter, son of John, from the village of Bethsaida in the province of Galilee, brother of Andrew the apostle, and himself chief of the apostles. So Peter was the chief of the apostles, and he himself lived in Antioch, Syria as the bishop. So he's not only apostle, he's the bishop of that church. And having preached to the dispersion, the believers in circumcision in Pontus, Galatia, Galatia, Cappadocia, Africa, I believe. Oh, no, Turkey, I'm sorry. Turkey, my apologies. Asia and Bithynia. Pushed on to Rome in the second year of Claudius to overthrow Simon Magus and held the sacerdotal or sa sacerdotal chair. He held the, uh, the position, basically a bishop there. There for 25 years unto the last, that is the 14th year of Nero. Now watch what Jerome says about Peter being in Rome. At his hands, he received the crown of martyrdom. Nero martyred Peter, because Peter was crucified upside down. Being nailed to the cross with his head towards the ground and his feet raised on high, asserting that he was unworthy to be crucified in the same manner as his Lord. Now watch this. He wrote two epistles, which are called Catholic. The second of which, on account of its difference from the first in style, is considered by many not to be by him. Then, too, the gospel according to Mark, who was his disciple and interpreter, is ascribed to him. On the other hand, the books of which is one is entitled his acts, another gospel, a third, his preaching, a fourth, his revelation, a fifth, his judgment are rejected as apocryphal. So he's talking about all these fake books attributed to him. But what does he say? Mark wrote down the gospel from Peter. Peter went to Rome and reigned there and was martyred there, crucified upside down because he was unworthy to die like his Lord. But now watch. Buried at Rome in the Vatican near the triumphal way, he is venerated by the whole world. So if Peter went to Rome and Mark is writing now the gospel of Peter, that means Peter, if he's the bishop of Antioch, Syria, would also go to Rome and establish a bishopric. Am I correct? Yeah, exactly. Like it says he's the bishop of Antioch. So can you imagine being the monarchical bishop of Antioch, then going to Rome and you're part of a college? That makes no sense. You know? So there you guys, you get it. And in fact, to prove that there is at this time in the time of the apostles, a bishop ruling the church with elders, in the second section, real quickly, he mentioned James the Just, the so-called brother of the Lord. This is from the same link I gave you. In two, he made James the Just. Now notice who James the Just is, real quickly, guys. James, who is called the brother of the Lord, surnamed the Just, the son of Joseph, by another wife as something, but as appears to me, the son of Mary, sister of the mother of our Lord, of whom John makes mention in his book. So he's not Jesus' uterine brother. He's a re relative called his brother. After the Lord's Passion, at once ordained by the apostles, Bishop of Jerusalem wrote a single epistle. Okay, so wait, wait, wait. James, the brother of the Lord, is appointed by apostles to be the Bishop of the Church at Jerusalem. Peter is the Bishop of the Church at Antioch until he finds a replacement. And he goes to Rome, and yet, instead of expecting him to follow this pattern, they appoint a Bishop, one, not Bishops to rule the churches in an area, Peter decides we're all going to be a group of presbyters and deacons, but we're not going to have a bishop ruling, which would contradict what Irenaeus said earlier that Peter and Paul appointed Linus as the bishop of Rome, right? Yep. So there we go. Cabin Ortland doesn't know what he's talking about, basically. So I got you right. Yes, and uh, I should point something out as well. Like, say, um, what's the most common work of, of St. Augustine? Like, what's his, if someone has read only one thing by St. Augustine, it's probably his Confessions or maybe City of yeah. God, right? Because those yeah, are his true. most well known works. He, he's got other works too, but um, th they're unlikely to be read by the average Christian. This work by St. Jerome on illustrious men is his most famous book. It's equivalent to confessions. That means that these people who are getting that Titus quote 
are just reading modern quote minds and modern scholarship instead of actually going to the source, not even his most common and most famous work on illustrious men. There you go. Now, one question that came up. Guys, this is the time to ask questions. I just asked these questions to clarify that I got it and you got it. If you got these arguments, so much for James White, Gavin Ortland, and other Protestants who butcher the fathers as they do scriptures. This is akin to, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to be rude, but let's be honest, our brother Anthony Rogers quoting a source without verifying it, a writing that didn't come from Jerome and a supposed epistle or a commentary that Jerome supposedly wrote on Romans to prove his understanding of sola fide, when in reality, that is a spurious letter that's not from Jerome. Some say it's actually perhaps from Pelagius and falsely attributed to Jerome. So that's akin to that. Anthony not doing his homework, simply citing some source that he relied on to tell him that Jerome had wrote a commentary on Rome, uh, Romans, when it turned out that's a fraud, because Jerome never wrote a commentary in Romans, and then having William calling them out for it and embarrassing him. So that's akin to what James White is doing with Ignatius and Clement and what Gavin Ortland's doing to Jerome. Am I correct? Am I getting it? Yeah, although I'd, I'd say that I, uh, I hold a higher opinion of Anthony Rogers than I do on, uh, on, on, on uh, than James White or Gavin Ortland. Like he, he compiled a, a book on the Trinity not too long ago. It's in my bookshelf over there. I like that. But yeah, that just shows that if you're going into other areas, you need to cross all your T's and dot all yeah. your I's. I'm very careful not to use an argument until I've checked the source, made sure it's authentic, checked the primary sources. I mean, I just got a collection of Pope Innocent III's officials. I, I quoted in uh, a live stream on Swan Sona's channel. But uh, yeah, no, try to, um, s since the, the the eighth and ninth century, flora legiums had, have become popular. And it was to save papyrus because paper, although it, it's cheap now to get paper, it was very expensive back then. They didn't even have paper, they had sheepskin. So by the way, that's but why, but unfortunately this has made a lot of people lazy. And it's not only, uh, um, uh, p people like James White. It's it, it's all of us. I used to do this too five ten years ago. I made mistakes too, but uh, the 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 best is thirdly to do your r research. Uh, st st stay in your field, and if you go out of your field, make sure you do a lot of reading until you start commenting on it. Well, brother, here I need to show you. Like here, you have a Soloidian, another what I call a demonic spiritual tool of the devil. Sorry for the harsh language, a spiritual bastard, Jake Williams, misrepresenting us and lying. Let me quote what this fanboy of James White, who burns incense to James White, just said. You falsely misrepresent James White's position on this matter. He believes in sola scriptura, unlike you, and would affirm elders were in Rome based on First Peter. So because, again, the guy is too stupid in his man worship. He thinks he's worshiping Jesus and he's honoring God when he's worshiping a man to his humiliation. Because he's so stupid, he didn't get the argument. So I'm going to help this Solowitian, Toto Whitney, this idolater, fanboy of James White, understand what the argument was. So now, Jake, try not to be as stupid <clears throat> as humanly possible. Let me repeat what the argument was. I know you're too blinded by your worship of James White. May the Lord Jesus save you from your idolatry. I didn't say James White rejects there were elders at Rome. I said this proves he's an inconsistent, dishonest, pervert, of both scripture and church history like you because his argument is ignatius mentioned no bishop when he wrote the letter to the romans and because he didn't mention a bishop that proves there was no head bishop at rome but if james white is consistent ignatius also didn't mention elders in his letter to the romans nor did he mention deacons in his letter to the romans so if James White is right, because Ignatius didn't mention the bishop of Rome, there was no bishop. He also didn't mention elders at Rome or deacons, which means that according to Ignatius, the church at Rome had no elders or deacons. But because you are a blind man worshiper, an idolater, a heathen who thinks you're, you're a Christian, you didn't get the argument. Of course I know 
James White is not as stupid as you. Of course, there would be elders at Rome. But his point is, Ignatius is proof there's no bishop at Rome. Well, Ignatius would also be proof there are no elders at Rome and there are no deacons at Rome. You see the point? So you can have your cake and eat it too. If you're going to use Ignatius to deny there's a bishop at Rome, then you're going to use him to deny there are elders at Rome and there are deacons at Rome because he mentions none of them. Do you get it now? Stop trying to be so stupid in defending your idolatry like a son of the devil and repent and fear the Lord Jesus. Sorry, brother. Sometimes I have to deal with these trolls. But brother, overall, we got the point. It was superb. Now, let me open up questions for you guys. If you have questions, unlike these Soloidians who worship a man and burn incense to him and think they are doing Jesus a favor to their humiliation, because in their blind zeal for man worship and their hatred for those who want to love Jesus and not pervert his word, they will blaspheme the Lord and slander us to defend their idol. But now, brother, one question was, okay, where do we begin if we want to study church history accurately and honestly and not butcher them like James White does? Well, by uh, by church history, I assume this guy means the the early church immediately after the scriptures. So like after Acts of the Apostles, after the um, epistles of, of St. Paul. Uh, what I would do is I would get yourself a copy uh, if you don't have a lot of cash, you can, uh, find this online of the apostolic fathers, the key people we've been discussing today, uh, Ignatius and Polycarp and, uh, Clement and the Didache. There's a few others as well. And a book that you'll want to get is this book. E Eusebius Church History. Um, we've quoted from this today. Uh, if you, you get this, it pretty much gives um, an, an outline of the church right prior to Nicaea until about 320 or something like that, like right before Nicaea, 320, 3, 4, something like that. And so, yeah, it's not that expensive. And all this stuff, if, if, if you don't have paper copies, if if you, I, I know times are tough, you know, a lot of people are out of jobs, uh, but you can find them all on newadvent.org. And something else you should get is read Jerome's on illustrious men. Now, yep. St. Jerome comes a bit l later, but he's, uh, keep in mind, he's a, a top scholar of, of scripture and tradition. And Sam just, just read from him, St. Peter and from St. James. But yeah, uh, basically that the, you you want to start with the Apostolic Fathers, Clement, Ignatius, Polycarp, and then move on to e Eusebius. That's the, the big one. It's a bit longer. But this book, I love this book. Like, And remember the very first sentence he says in this book, we go back to the beginning of the a video and uh, and uh, and check it out. In fact, guys, I just put the link on the screen. Watch newadvent.org backslash fathers backslash the writings of the early church fathers, even Jerome, illustrious men, translated English, available online for free there. I even quoted from Jerome and also from Eusebius, and I posted the quotations and the links right there in the description box. Check out the description box. They're there. Now, another question, brother, because William Webster also wrote a book, The Church of Rome at the Bar of History, where he tries to quote church fathers, early sources to show that Roman Catholicism and its view of monarchical episcopate or Peter as the rock and the Pope as the successor, all wrong. So the question from our brother, McVine, who's also a passionate young brother, young Catholic brother who loves Jesus, how unreliable is William Webster's research? Well, um, I'll, I'll confess offhand, I've not r r read that book, but I've interacted with people who have. Like I interacted, in fact, I'm talking with, uh, I was talking with Ken Temple a, a, a few days ago. Yeah. And he was... Sort of and he, uh, like, like I asked him w w what uh, examples of papal blunders does uh, th does 
does Webster bring up in his book about the papacy? And it's 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 same old, same old, you know, Cyprian versus Stephen, and um, like like um, Pope Liberius. Although more sources say that uh, Pope Liberius did not sign that document, then do sign it. There's a few that say he did, in, and but there's more that say he did not, including a pagan source, um, Pope Fijoius, Pope Honorius, uh, the, the uh, Pope Paul V, and Pope Urban VIII, because they deal with Galileo. I I I, uh, I told uh, Ken to read Doctor Syngenis on that one. And now, brother Ken Temple. Sadly, like this, Jake Williams is a rabid soloidian. He worships at the feet of James White. He just salivates over James White. And, and he knows, I've called him out, and I'm going to call him out again. He's probably one of the most repulsive, inconsistent, <clears throat> dishonest Protestant apologists. And I don't just say this of everyone. And I'm very politically correct. Our brother is more gracious than me. He, along with few others like James White disgust me because they're not interested about truthful arguments, consistency, and handling the fathers with integrity. Their main interest is to destroy Roman Catholicism like I used to, where I used to blindly follow them. But again, Ken Temples is not a man of integrity. And you hear me, Ken, I know you're watching me. I have no respect for you. I've called you out to debate on limited atonement. Let's do it. William Albrecht has called you to debate on the Marian doctrines. Let's do this, friend. Because I'm getting tired of these guys who claim to love scripture and seek to be honest, perverting the church fathers, slandering Roman Catholic apologists, and having a blind fascination of James White. May God heal us from that and save us from that, and may the Lord be glorified. Now, any other final questions, guys? Well, is, Lord, is, is it okay if I I, I, I I say something there? Please, brother. Put me I, in place. I mean, uh, Ken Temple, like I've, I've, I've always had... Um, some good interactions with the guy, but, but unfortunately he, he just seems to be repeating all the stuff from James White and stuff. And, and then even after I refute it, he brought it up again. I'll give you an example. He likes to bring up Cyprian versus Stephen and Cyprian had 80 bishops with him. There's a quote from St. Jerome. St. Jerome says that all of the followers of Cyprian repudiated that view that Cyprian held and published a document that condemned that that said the the position of St Stephen so they abandoned Cyprian and and then uh unfortunately Ken Temple went into kind of a hyper skeptic mode like he's like oh how do we know that's true I'm like well I I mean how come you're quoting St Jerome on his commentary on Titus you're putting a lot of stock in that but you're you're employing a high level of skepticism for that, and I, I mean I think it's problematic. Like 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 for example, it, it, if I get refuted on something, I'm not going to go to it again. Like I was debating a long time ago. I was talking with a Muslim apologist in the comments on my blog somewhere. I I couldn't tell you where. I can't remember, but he refuted me on something and i've not used that argument since like i'm clever i i've i found a way around it but i went and did m my research i'm not going to repeat the same thing over and over again especially if i know someone can re refute it and here's a gentleman who just asked an irrelevant question but i'm going to address it uh, because i just talked Eusebius, Euse Euse which means he can't read and I think he's another troll trying to discredit what was the unanimous view of the fathers, except for the heretics. He says, basically, here he says, well, hey, brother, why Eusebius? He says, I'm a brother, so I'm going to give him the benefit of doubt. But even that sign shows he's more of a Protestant who wants to prove Mary was not a virgin after she gave birth to Christ. Why Eusebius in his book, this is a church book, two page notes, mentioned James as a brother of the Lord. Uh, this again shows either your dishonesty or ignorance because... That title, Brother of the Lord, is found in the New Testament. The question is, what does it mean for him to be called the Brother of the Lord? Because here you have the same Eusebius that you selectively cite in chapter 12, paragraph 4, 
chapter 12, paragraph 4, saying this. Okay? Here you go. Let's just let me quote it. Oh, your Catholic brother? Okay, I'm sorry. Afterwards, he says he appeared to James, who was one of the so-called brethren of the Savior. Even that statement, so-called brethren of the Savior, shows that when he calls him the brother of the Lord, it means this is the title given to him in the New Testament because he's known as the brother of the Lord. But the question is, what does it mean for him to be the brother of the Lord? As we've done shows on this and we've quoted fathers to show, even close relatives who are raised in the same household could be called brothers. And we've gone through the evidence. So just to quote to me a passage where James is said to be brother Lord and everyone acknowledges he's called the brother Lord. What does it mean? Go to the sessions and watch those sessions that I did with William and Father Kappas on that issue. But that's not relevant to the topic. So unless we have a topic that's relative, relative, relevant, and I'm calling out Jake Williams. God, call me on Skype. Let's see how brave and knowledgeable you are to defend your slander and lies and your idol. And let's go live, Jake Williams. I'll be waiting for your Skype call so we can go live, so I can decimate your idolatry, your slander, and your blasphemy by the grace of Jesus Christ. Now, brother, I don't see any questions that are relevant because the points were clear and to the point. So everyone got the message. As far back as you can trace the evidence, the structure of the church was a monarchical episcopate. So there was one bishop who was the head of the churches in an area, presbyters subject to him and deacons beneath them. So, brother, do you want to make any final comments on this point? And then we'll wrap it up. And Lord willing, I will be bringing you back to talk about the Crusades. Uh, is, is, is it okay if I say something to uh, Jonathan Please. there? So, what you can, Jonathan... Two apologists that you'd want to consult on this, their top apologist is my friend John Fisher 2.0. He runs the uh, the YouTube channel Original Win Productions. And my friend Father James, he's an Anglican priest, but he, he's very good on this as well. And he runs the YouTube channel Barely Protestant. They're, they're two great guys, and they're both very good on this topic. Well, if they're if they're willing to come, I'll host them. If you contact them for me and put them in contact with me, I'll bring both of them on separately to talk about whether these are the uterine brothers of Jesus from the same mother or they are related to Jesus and raised in the same household. And so they're called brothers in that sense. So that's the position I assume they take, that Mary remained a perpetual virgin? Yes, they're both from believers uh and the, the, they both actually uh uh especially john has dialogue with ken temple on this and he uses saint jerome's arguments uh, in favor of the um the the perpetual virginity of the blessed virgin mary and yet one of them is an anglican who believes that mary's a perpetual virgin huh yeah so let me repeat this again an anglican church of england who's not orthodox or Catholic, or Coptic Orthodox, or Church of the East, he's persuaded and convinced by the Bible and early church history, Mary is a perpetual virgin who had no children after she gave birth to Jesus Christ. Did I hear you correctly? Yeah, that's true. In fact, uh, something that uh, James White doesn't want you to know is that there were early Protestants, and Protestants still today, who believe this. Martin Luther uh, believed yep. in the perpetual virginity of Mary, and and he broke from the Catholic Church, but he he knew he knew the same thing that Jerome knew, the same mm -hmm. thing that we knew. Interesting. So it's not just a Catholic argument. So, folks, unless you have questions related, I think he's done a great job of summing up the evidence. And let's wrap it uh, wrap it up, brother. Any final, any final comments or statements so we can conclude? All right, I'll just just wrap it up. Just like I said to the one. Gentlemen, read the Apostolic Fathers and e Eusebius and um, uh, pray every day. I'd recommend the rosary and, uh, and, tr and try to read the scripture for at least 15 minutes every day. Um, subscribe to my YouTube channel, Alan Rule, A-L-L-A-N space R-U-H-L. And um, I've got an interview coming up on Friday and I'm going to be on Sam's channel again to talk about the, um, the Crusades. And uh, thanks for watching, and God bless you all. And Sam, thanks for allowing me to come on your platform. Brother, I hope you will come more often because I want to tap into your mind because you're an expert on church history. 
And you're a member of the body of Christ whose gifts we need to build us up. So, guys, hit the like button. Upload this discussion. Invite more people to watch it. And have them also, if they want, upload it to their channels. And I put the link to his <clears throat> blog and his YouTube channel. Help this brother go viral. Subscribe to his channel. Pray for him and pray for me. Pray for our health. Pray for our safety. Pray for our holiness and purity to truly love Jesus. Obey Jesus, serve the Lord Jesus, not just pay lip service and ask the Lord to strengthen me to keep getting healthier so my health won't hinder me, but my health will be used by the Spirit to glorify Christ and pray for our loved ones, my daughters, and for provision. And Lord Jesus willing, I'll see you tomorrow. Christ is risen, risen indeed, modern author, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.